387-0770. That's 387-0770. Your neighbors at 909 West 2nd Street in San Bernardino. This is KCAA Loma Linda, the station that leaves no listener behind. CNBC News is next, a courtesy of BuySellMakeOffer.com, where you can post a video about items you have for sale. Sign up now. It's free. CNBC Radio. Stocks today adding to the run-up in October by notching some sharp gains. The energy and healthcare sectors leading the way. The Dow up 165 points and pushing into positive territory for the year. Chevron and Exxon Mobil with the biggest blue chip gainers today. The Nasdaq added 73 points. Biotech stocks saw some big gains. After the closing bell, though, some earnings misses from Avis Budget, restaurant chain Texas Roadhouse, and a surprise loss last quarter from insurance giant AIG, which blamed volatile world markets for some investments that went bad. Fitbit, though, topped earnings forecast but is lower in late trading. And shares of Chipotle today down 2.5%. It shut down 43 restaurants in Oregon and Washington State after dozens of customers were sickened by E. coli, the third such outbreak at the chain this year. Now, health officials are still investigating the cause, but thankfully, no deaths have been reported. I'm Tom Busby, CNBC Radio. Ringing in the ears, all natural ring relief helps. Our customers tell the story. Peter C. says, this is the first thank you I have ever written to a company. Your ring relief product has greatly reduced my tinnitus. Thank you for the good night's sleep. James H. wrote, this is the first time I've been free of ear ringing in over a year. These are unsolicited testimonials from our customers. No gimmicks. If you suffer from tinnitus, join the thousands who found relief with all natural ring relief. Ring relief is available at Kroger, CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, and Walmart. Or go to ringrelief.com for ring relief eardrops. There are no guarantees in love, but there is a guarantee from EH Plus by eHarmony, our new personal matchmaking service. At EH Plus, your own personal matchmaker gets to know you so well, we can guarantee introductions that will be satisfying and exciting. EH Plus goes far beyond regular online dating sites, and that's a guarantee. Visit us at ehplus.com slash love or call 1-855-930-LOVE. You're listening to KCAA Loma Linda at 106.5 FM, K293CF, Moreno Valley. Consider this your invitation to sell. At buysellmakeoffer.com, you can sell as much as you want for the next 60 days without paying any fees whatsoever. Sound incredible? It is, and it's true. Buysellmakeoffer.com is the new exciting way to sell your stuff online. Make extra money right now. Sell your old car, furniture, video games, household items, clothes, even your home. Sell anything that's legal. Load up your stuff to sell right now at buysellmakeoffer.com. This is your official invitation to get on board to sell your stuff right now free for the next 60 days and once you see how easy it is you'll want to sign up for more because there are no item fees that's right take this opportunity to move items from the other guys and sell it for free you might even win a samsung tablet amazon gift cards and other cool prizes buy sell make offer.com is the future of online selling you can use skype to talk to your buyer or seller plus you can use video to showcase your items buy sell make offer.com Good afternoon. It's 3.03. I'm Di Rice with the only live local news here in the Inland Empire on KCAA 1050 AM. San Bernardino's 10th fatal traffic mishap this month involved another hit-and-run motorist and another pedestrian. Police say that late Thursday, a 78-year-old woman was crossing 9th Street within a marked crosswalk when she was run down by a newer four-door white vehicle. Witnesses say that the driver failed to stop and left the scene. Maria Lazariga of San Bernardino died as paramedics arrived. A surveillance video of the suspect vehicle was obtained from a business near the intersection of L Street. The accident marked the city's 37th traffic fatality this year, greatly surpassing the community's 23 homicide deaths. And a long-planned facility to be shared by both Hemet Schools and a Regional Park District looks to be finally moving on. The 8.8-acre plot on the southwest corner of Mayberry and Fairview Avenues in Valle Vista, east of Hemet, was donated to Hemet Unified, Unified School District and Valley Wide Recreation and Park District more than a decade ago, but plans stalled due to the lack of funding. Now, the $3 million project has a new life, thanks in part to a $1.4 million grant to 
Hemet Unified from First Five Riverside. The Riverside County Children's and Families Commission, which utilizes state tobacco tax taxes. The school district will construct an early childhood education center on that site, and that will also include preschool programs. Valley Wide will build and maintain out to outdoor recreational facilities. The facility will also include a large parking lot which can provide overflow parking for Valle Vista Elementary across the street. Inland Empire weather Still a chance of showers and 70% uh, chance of showers actually tonight and then diminishing Tuesday and ending for good. So they say early Wednesday. Tomorrow's high about 71. Today's high 79 with an overnight low of about 54. Currently we are at 70 degrees here in San Bernardino. Not too sure if we're going to hit that high. Looking at your drive, there's not a lot going on. A little stop and go traffic on the 91 eastbound between Green River Road and the 71. And other than that, you're looking pretty good out there for a Monday afternoon. Enjoy your ride. That is the very latest with news, weather, and traffic on the station that leaves no listener behind. KCAA 1050 AM with Foster to Foster coming up next. Did you know Cover California can help you find a low-cost quality health care plan that's absolutely right for you and your family? Did you know there's coverage for unexpected emergencies and everyday aches and pains? Did you know free preventative care like blood pressure and cholesterol screenings are also provided to stop small problems from getting bigger? Well, now you know. Covered California. It's more than just health care. It's life care. Visit CoveredCA.com to find free, local, in-person help or enroll online by December 15th to have coverage by January 1st. This is KCAA. Welcome to Foster to Foster. Now here's your host, Dr. Anissa McNeil. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Anissa McNeil, and welcome to Foster to Foster Radio Show. Today, our entire show is based upon a question that was asked by two individuals, actually. One is a middle school foster youth in Los Angeles, and one is a graduate student that is a former foster youth here in San Bernardino County. And the two questions that were asked that I thought went well together for today's show is the first question is, why do I have a foster counselor at my middle school? So while I was out talking to foster youth, a middle school student asked me, Dr. McNeil, why do I have a counselor at my school? The next question is, was asked by a graduate student here in San Bernardino County who asked me, Dr. McNeil, why is there a buzz about foster youth and education now? That was not the case when I went to school here in California. And so I'm so excited today that our show today will focus on the new legislation in California, which directly impacts the education of foster youth. Some of this legislation that we're going to discuss this afternoon is groundbreaking. We've never had this, these types of laws that will help foster youth in our education system. And so I want to start with the most groundbreaking uh, piece of legislation here in the state of California. First, before we jump right into the new legislation law, let's look at our state's way of defining who is a foster youth. According to the California Department of Education, Youth in foster care must have an open dependency court case, which means that your case in dependency court must remain open. And it does not matter rather you live in a foster home, a group home, relative care, or with your biological parent. The matter there is if your case is open in children's court, in dependency court. It also includes youth on probation. You must have an open delinquency case and be removed from your home. And this is the first time ever that we have included um, youth that are on probation, that are also in the foster care system, that are a part of this definition. So what is this new groundbreaking legislation, you may ask? So for all of our listeners, let's think, uh, if you're out there, how can a foster youth or how does a foster youth differ from any other student in our public education system? Some of the very unique education challenges to foster youth, um, and this is by, this 
is this information was given by Martha Matthews of Public Council's Children Rights Project. And some of they indicate that some of the unique educational needs of foster youth are as follows. One, education outcomes for foster youth lag behind those for other students, even when we compare them to low-income students or English language learners. Foster youth are faced with the unique educational challenges such as frequent school changes, gaps in their education, lack of consistent adult support for education, and the impact of trauma on their education. And so with those unique needs, our state, and here in the state of California, in 2013, we passed new legislation that focused directly on foster youth. So now let's talk about what that is. In 2013, California school funding law is now called the Local Control Funding Formula. Now, you, you're listening out there and you say, okay, Dr. McNeil, what in the world does that mean? That just means that every public school that is funded by the state of California must follow this funding model that we're going to discuss right now in order to receive their funds from the state. It says that districts receive supplemental and concentrated grants based on the percentage of students who are, one, low income, two, English language learners, and three, foster youth. What? Yes. For the first time in the state of California, as of 2013, our state has identified a category for only foster youth. So let's go on with the new Local Control Funding Formula, also called LCFF. What does it say that we have to do? It says each district must create a local control and accountability plan, meaning that now that we've given you this money and we have identified these three groups that need additional support and we will provide you with supplemental funding, you must also provide us with an accountability plan. The accountability plan has to have goals for all students and for each subgroup, meaning that if you were to go to your local school district and look on their website, you should see what we call a LCAP, L-C-A-P, or your local control uh, and accountability plan. In that plan, they must have goals for all students in their district. In addition to that, they must have three additional goals. One, for low-income students, two, for English language learners, and three, goals for foster youth. That's what the local um, accountability plan stands for. So why is this so groundbreaking? Never before in the state of California have we had public education dollars targeted towards helping to identify the needs and improve the education of foster youth. What you've heard me say so many times on this show is that foster youth currently have a 50% chance of graduating from high school. Of the 50% that graduate, 10% go off to colleges, and a mere Three percent of those individuals graduate from college. So what we know to be true is that foster youth are so far behind in our education system. In addition to that, if only 50 percent graduate, if you're listening out there, you're saying, well, Dr. McNeil, what happens to the other 50 percent? I'm so sad to report to you that 50 percent of foster youth after leaving our uh, foster care system will become homeless. When we return back from our short break, we're going to talk about how school districts can work together to improve the education of foster youth. This is Dr. Anissa McNeil, and you're listening to Foster to Foster Radio Show.
Here's your Money Minute with Market Wrap host Mo Ansari. If you follow the markets, you've probably been getting seasick lately. But what if I told you that market volatility can be a good thing? If you're a bargain hunter, this is your coupon. So keep your shopping list handy. If you're a long-term investor with plenty of time before retirement, the money going into your 401k each month will buy more shares when the markets are down. And if you have a good financial plan, you can relax while others worry because that plan will carry you beyond today's headlines. Of course, you should always consider professional guidance before making any financial decisions. That's your Money Minute. I'm Mo Ansari. For more tips on investing during market volatility and other investment topics, listen to Market Wrap weekdays at 5 p.m. on this station. For a free consultation with Mo Ansari, call 800-388-9700. That's 800-388-9700. Compact Asset Management is a registered investment advisor. Funds custodian Fidelity Institutional Wealth Services, member FINRA SIPC. Glamour Gowns and Suit Up Committee cordially invites you to the fourth annual Day at the Races, Sunday, October 25th at 12 noon at Santa Anita Race Park. Please come and join us for fun activities, games, and to benefit foster youth that need prom dresses and suits. Our fourth annual Day at the Races will be held on Sunday, October 25th at noon at the Santa Anita Park. Please come out and join Glamour Gown and Suit Up Committee. For your tickets, please visit CasaLA.org. We look forward to seeing you at the Day of the Races on October 25th. Education Works Consulting Firm provides foster youth education services. We work to make sure that every foster youth has a chance by providing a way through education. Please visit us at edworks4u.org or call our offices at 213-634-0044. Education works for all of us. Here's Foster to Foster with your host, Dr. Anissa McNeil. Welcome back to Foster to Foster Radio Show. We are engaged in talking about the groundbreaking new legislation in education that impacts foster youth. We left off by starting to look at how can school districts, courts, and DCFF work together to improve the education outcomes of foster youth. One thing that we know or that we would like to see more collaboration with is not every placement should cause a change in their school. So what happens with foster youth, a lot of the times they will leave from one group home and be placed at another group home. And in changing that placement, they will also change schools. And that has a great impact on their education. We're asking, they, they report that the court should consider the school calendar, that we all work together to see when school is in, when school takes a break, and that everyone knows the school calendar. Foster youth should not be pushed out of comprehensive schools. Sometimes what we find is that foster youth have gone from school to school to school, and then when they get in high school, they're often, or sometimes they're asked to attend uh, alternative schools or credit recovery schools. So we're asking if we could all work together to kind of eliminate that. Placement changes should not cause gaps in attendance. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more here on our show this afternoon. But sometimes when foster youth are placed in various placements, they don't attend school for a period of days. And so today we're going to go over a law that we have here in the state of California that says that that should not be so, that when they go from placement to placement, they have the right to have immediate, immediate, the day of enrollment in their school so that they don't lose attendance. Or And in some high schools in our state, if you don't attend school for a certain number of days, you lose high school credit. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is significant. I'm going to take a little water break here. Um, so let's continue of how schools, districts can work together. <coughs> so sorry. Every foster youth should have 
an informed and active education rights holder. You heard in the commercial break that my company, is, we serve as court-appointed education rights holders for foster youth. It's critical, it's imperative that they have an adult that is one, knowledgeable about the education system, and two, that is knowledgeable about the court system in order to advocate and work with them for their education rights. So now we've had a chance to talk about our groundbreaking LCFF and LCAP, which impact all public schools here in the state of California. When you hear the changes that we've made in our public school district, I hope that you are as energetic and excited that I, as I am because for the very first time, we have public legislation and, pu and a public funding model that has zeroed in or is trying to help um, improve the outcomes for foster youth. So you said, Dr. McNeil, we're going to learn more laws that help to impact the education services of foster youth. First, I want to start with one of the most uh, impactful laws that don't, it not only affects foster youth, but it affects so many children um, and previous students within our public school system. This law goes into effect, effective October 7th, 2015. SB 172 suspended the Casey, that is our California high school exit exam. So what is this law does, the existing or the previous law required all students to pass the California high school exit exam as a condition of receiving their high school diploma. This new law, SB 172, if you're out there, all the kids listen to this, the new law, SB 172, suspended the administration of the KC and required that students pass the KC and the requirement that students pass the KC as a condition of receiving their high school diploma for the years 2015 to 2018. It also requires that schools grant diplomas to any pupil, any student that completed 12th grade in 2003-2004 school years and on. So what we know now is that if you were in high school in 2003 and that you did not receive your high school diploma because you did not pass the Casey and you met every other requirement, you can now contact your public school and ask for your high school diploma. Now, listeners, that is a groundbreaking law. So many students in our state did not receive a high school diploma because they did not pass the Casey. And so this will open up the door for many students to obtain a high school diploma. We have a caller. Oh, I'm sorry. We just lost our caller. Caller, if you're out there, call us back. So when we look at SB 172, you will see that this really, this legislation that went into effect on October 7th really opened up the ground for any high school student or previous high school student that does not have a high school diploma because you did not pass the Casey. Let's go on to talk about another law that really is helping uh, foster youth. And so we're going to go on to uh, S, I'm sorry, Assembly Bill AB 1166. Now, what does that law read right now, Dr. McNeil? If you're listening, that law states that, ex ex I'm sorry, foster youth, it exempts foster youth from completing district graduation requirements and instead allows them to graduate by completing the state minimum requirements if the student had to transfer after the second year of high school. It requires school districts to notify the foster youth 
of the availability of the exemption and whether and rather they qualify for the exemption within 30 days of the school transfer. That was the previous law. So what happens now? This law has been amended. And the new law states that provided that if the school district fails to make the required notification within 30 days of the school transfer, the pupil still has the ability um, for the exemption once notified, even if that notification occurs after the court has terminated their jurisdiction. If the pupil would have otherwise qualify for the exemption. So what does this law say? It says that if you're a foster youth and you have entered into high school, this is your second year in the high school, and you had to transfer after your second year in high school, that you may qualify for an exemption, which means that you only have to meet the state requirements to graduate from high school. Meeting those state requirements, you should be given notification within 30 days of your transfer. Now, be very mindful that some of, these, some of the state requirements may not meet all the requirements for you to attend a UC or a Cal State University. So you want to be very careful when you look at those exemptions. Talk to your counselor, state that you transferred, ask questions, especially if you want to go on to college or if you want to do something different. Um, I know sometimes it's very tempting if you have the ability to do the least that you can do. But if you have the ability to challenge yourself a little bit and see if you can do your very best, it will um, help you later on in the future. So that is AB 1166. That's another new law that helps our foster youth. Let's go on to talk about State Bill 444. I'm sorry, State Bill 445. It says your school of origin. And earlier during our show today, listeners, we talked about one of the unique challenges of foster youth is that when they're placed from one placement to the other placement, they oftentimes change schools. What we know to be true is according to the state bill 445, this states that federal law allows homeless youth to remain in their school of origin. The existing law providing foster and homeless youth with certain educational rights applied to charter schools only if the charter participated in a special education local plan area. Now, the new law states this. That if you are a foster youth, you get to remain in your school of origin for the remainder of the school year. Or if in high school to the remainder to remain in their high school of origin through graduation. And that's wonderful that you will get to stay in the school of origin until the end of that school year and just imagine the impact that that has for foster youth, knowing that if I started at this high school and even if I change placements, even if I go from group home to group home, that I get to graduate from this high school. So if you are a foster youth and you are in high school and you say, Dr. McNeil, what is the name of that bill? What can I say to my social worker, to my group home, or to my counselor to say, hey, I have the right to stay at this school? That bill is SB 445. It's called the School of Origin for Homeless Students. And it also includes charter schools for the very first time. Even if you go to a charter school, you have the ability to stay in that school for the remainder of the school year or throughout graduation if you are in high school. This has never happened before, and this is a great and wonderful bill. When you come back from our break, we're going to discuss more groundbreaking legislation here in the state of California that is helping our foster youth be more uh, to achieve their education goals in our public education system. We'll be right back. 
And now it's time for another Support San Bernardino Spotlight. Hi, my name is George Hahn. I am the Senior Minister at the Center for Spiritual Living Inland Empire. In the next few weeks, we would like to support San Bernardino by highlighting the outstanding things about our city. Today's program features Michelle Takia, please tell us about your involvement with the symphony. Thank you, Reverend George. In the summer of 2008, I founded, established, and became artistic director of Symphony Jeunesse Youth Orchestra for Strings. It was established for serious string instrumental students ages 12 to 18 wishing to advance their musical studies. Season one opened with 12 students, and over the next seven seasons, the orchestra has grown to 35 members. We will be performing at Temple Emmanuel in Redlands on Tuesday, November 24th at 7 p.m. for the San Bernardino Clergy Association's annual Thanksgiving service. Symphony Jeunesse holds auditions and is always looking for new members. Donations are welcome. Please call 951-203-0759. That's 951-203-0759. Thank you. This program was underwritten by Center for Spiritual Living Inland Empire. If you would like information about today's program, please contact me, Reverend George, by calling 909-883-7171. That's 909-883-7171. Glamour Gowns and Suit Up Committee cordially invites you to the fourth annual Day at the Races, Sunday, October 25th at 12 noon at Santa Anita Race Park. Please come and join us for fun activities, games, and to benefit foster youth that need prom dresses and suits. Our fourth annual Day at the Races will be held on Sunday, October 25th at noon at the Santa Anita Park. Please come out and join Glamour Gown and Suit Up Committee for your tickets, please visit CasaLA.org. We look forward to seeing you at the Day of the Races on October 25th. Education Works Consulting Firm provides foster youth education services. We work to make sure that every foster youth has a chance by providing a way through education. Please visit us at edworks4u.org or call our offices at 213-634-0044. Education works for all of us. We're back to Foster to Foster with your host, Dr. Anissa McNeil. So welcome back, listeners. You're probably thinking, Dr. McNeil, you're putting a lot of emphasis on the new legislation for our foster youth. And I want to let you go and know how personal this is. I currently serve as an Ed Rights holder for a foster youth. That foster youth has been in so many different school placements. And unfortunately, that person did not have the ability to graduate from high school. That person is now struggling to find where they will work, where they will live, what they will do. I'm not, I don't want to just inform you of the new legislation, but I wanna make it very personal for you. If you're not a foster youth, or maybe you're a teacher, or maybe you're just a member of our community, and you say, Dr. McNeil, how does this impact me? Why, why should I pay attention to what's going on in public school, which impacts foster youth? Because 50% of them will become 50% of our foster youth that exit our foster care system Within one year of exiting the foster care system, they will become homeless. That is exactly what happened to the foster youth that I just spoke to you about. That individual has experienced homelessness in less than a year of exiting the system. So, Dr. McNeil, how does that impact me as a community member? That's the person that's walking around your community searching for food or searching for a job. So all of these pieces of legislation, they not only help foster youth, but they help us as a community, as a society, be able to say, how can we meet the unique challenges of foster youth? What can we do to make sure that their education and the educational services that they receive support them in growing. 
I also want you to think about how important it is to maybe have a piece of legislation that would support them. For most of us, when we have a challenge in school, uh, we are able to tell mom, tell dad, tell our guardian, and, and we can tell our guardian, this is my challenge in school, and they will go up to the public school or go to your school or go to your charter school and talk with the teacher and see how they can work with you and help you do your homework. And they work with you in order to resolve whatever challenge you may have. But think if you are a foster youth, you don't have a mom or a dad to go to your school and to help you with whatever it could be. It could be something so simple as a lunch line or, oh, wow, I've been putting my homework in the wrong bin. Um, help me understand the morning routine in the classroom. All of those little things that a parent would do. So now let's talk about two pieces of legislation that tries to put an adult in place to assist foster youth. And they are called education rights holder. Holders. Let's talk about Assembly Bill 224. Assembly Bill 224 is the Notice of Educational Rights of Foster Youth. The existing law, it requires um, that your local school designate a staff person as the educational liaison for foster youth. So that answers the question of when the foster youth asked me, the middle school student asked me, why do I have a foster youth counselor at my school? That person is actually not a counselor, but a foster youth liaison. It requires that the public notice of educational rights of homeless students be disseminated in schools. So every person that attends that school, rather they're in foster care or not in foster care, they should receive a notice about educational rights for foster youth. So now let's talk about the new the new law. This new law will go into effect January 1st, 2016. The new law requires that requires the CDE, the California Department of Education, in consultation with the California Foster Youth Education Task Force to develop a standardized notice of the educational rights of foster children. The notice shall include a complaint process information as applicable. The department shall make the notice available to education liaisons for foster youth for dissemination by posting the notice on its internet website. So what this says is that we want to notify everyone. We want to make a public notice that every foster youth, every school district, your local education agency or your local school district should designate a staff person as the education liaison for foster youth. That's huge. That's great. That's a wonderful, wonderful law that will go into effect January of 2016. Now let's go to Assembly Bill 424. This new law appoints CASAs, which I serve as CASA, a court-appointed special advocate, for students who are also in the juvenile delinquency system. Wow, that's awesome. That's groundbreaking. Never before have we had CASAs work in children's delinquency court. CASAs have only worked in children's dependency court, which means that they're just in children's court. They haven't committed any type of crime or being, been charged of any type of crime. This is a new groundbreaking legislation that says that even if you are in delinquency court, you can be aborted a CASA. That's, that's riveting. That's groundbreaking. How many children could benefit from having a CASA advocate and work for them within the system to make sure that they get the services that they need and that they're able to transition very well? Now, another piece of legislation that we really want to talk about and what this means, I'm going to put these 
pieces of legislation together because they all have to do with um, graduation and credits needed to graduate. And so let's what we will do is talk about a piece of legislation that does not have to do with that. And right now, well, it has to do with your graduation requirements. That's AB 220. AB 220 is a new law that will go into effect as of January 2016. And that new law says that if you are in high school, you are required to co complete ma Algebra 1 or Mathematics 1 in order to receive your high school diploma. Um, and that is trying to align with our common core standards. So if you're listening, you're saying, Dr. McNeil, why is there a law about taking Algebra 1 or Mathematics 1? Before, in order to get your high school diploma, you could only get a diploma if you met or exceeded Algebra 1. But if you look at the new Common Core Standards, Common Core Standards doesn't have just a, just a course for Algebra 1. It has a lot of blended courses, and sometimes that blended course is titled Mathematics 1. This is the legislation's ability to try to meet some of that, um, some of the new standards in our common core. So they're, there's a little, they're offering a little versatility here, a little flexibility saying it must meet or exceed the rigor of algebra one or mathematics one. And so that's allowing a little bit of flexibility in what standards are utilized to make sure that all of our students meet the graduation standards. When we come back from this very short break, we're going to review all of the new legislation that enables our foster youth to graduate from high school. You're listening to Dr. Anissa McNeil. I do the work and I tell the stories of foster youth. Glamour Gowns and Suit Up Committee cordially invites you to the fourth annual Day at the Races, Sunday, October 25th at 12 noon at Santa Anita Race Park. Please come and join us for fun activities, games, and to benefit foster youth that need prom dresses and suits. Our fourth annual Day at the Races will be held on Sunday, October 25th at noon at the Santa Anita Park. Please come out and join Glamour Gown and Suit Up Committee. For your tickets, please visit CasaLA.org. We look forward to seeing you at the Day of the Races on October 25th. Did you know Cover California can help you find a low-cost quality health care plan that's absolutely right for you and your family? Did you know there's coverage for unexpected emergencies and everyday aches and pains? Did you know free preventative care like blood pressure and cholesterol screenings are also provided to stop small problems from getting bigger? Well, now you know. Covered California. It's more than just health care. It's life care. Visit CoveredCA.com to find free, local, in-person help or enroll online by December 15th to have coverage by January 1st. Education Works Consulting Firm provides foster youth education services. We work to make sure that every foster youth has a chance by providing a way through education. Please visit us at edworks4u.org or call our offices at 213-634-0044. Education works for all of us. Give yourself the investment of a lifetime. Enjoy this holiday season in a luxury estate home at Charleston Estates, the only new home neighborhood in prestigious South Redlands and smartly priced from the mid-800,000s. Charleston Estates features gourmet kitchens and California rooms that make holiday entertaining even more memorable. Homes reach 4,463 square feet with up to five bedrooms. Ask about our discounted HOA dues and move-in incentives, too. Visit MaliaHomes.com for details. That's MaliaHomes.com. Let's head back to Foster to Foster with your host, Dr. Anissa McNeil. Welcome back to Foster to Foster Radio Show. I am Dr. Anissa McNeil, and we're engaged in a very spirited conversation about the new legislation here in the state of California, which impacts the education services of foster youth. 
And before we dive into our next piece of legislation, I want to remind you listeners of what are some of the unique challenges that we discuss that really impact foster youth. And some of the unique challenges that they face are frequent school changes. And we discussed a law today that allows them to stay in their school of origin until the end of the school year, or even if they're in high school, they're able to stay until they graduate from high school. We have a caller. Caller, welcome to Foster to Foster Radio Show. What's your name, caller? Hello. Hi. Hi, Carla. Hi, Welcome to Brandy. F- Hi, Brandy. Do you have a question? Welcome to Foster to Foster Radio Show. Um. Well, I guess I was calling in to get a better feel of the situation. Like, I'm not familiar with foster care system, so I'm not sure how um, this whole situation works out. Oh, great. That's an excellent question, Brandy. What happens in education? We were talking about some of the unique needs of foster youth. So sometimes, Brandy, when they have to move from home to home, they have gaps in their education. So sometimes they don't attend school. They don't get enrolled in school quickly, as well as they may go to another school and they may repeat classes. They may be placed in different classes but it's all because they don't have the continuity. They don't stay consistently in one school. So earlier in the show, <clears throat> excuse me, we discussed a school of origin law. That was the state bill 445 that says that if you are a foster youth, even if you change group, group homes, Brandy, you have the right to stay to, in that school to the end of the school year. And it also allows that even if you're a foster youth and you're in high school, that you can stay in that high school until you graduate from high school. That way they will have continuous education without being disrupted as they go from placement to placement. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. And so you also asked about, you know, just trying to put your arms around this issue. Why Why must we have state legislation to help foster youth in, the, in their education system? They also have gaps in attendance, but not just gaps in attendance, but also gaps in course content. For example, I was working with a, a young foster uh, youth that was enrolled in high school. And Brandy, to my shock and awe, This student had taken Algebra 1 five times and passed five times. But she just kept repeating. Every time she changed the school, she kept repeating Algebra 1 over and over. And so now we have a new state bill. It's called Assembly Bill 1012. And that is a bill that hopes to stop the repetition of of courses. It says that we have to do our due diligence to look at their transcript, look at their paperwork, and stop them from repeating those courses. So that, excuse me, maybe that student could have had a different opportunity to do a different math or maybe meet more of the UC requirements or the CSU requirements so that they can um, have an opportunity to attend college. But if we're not paying attention to if they are repeating courses, then that happens a lot as you move from school to school. Does that make sense? Yeah. So my question uh, is, if there are these, if this is law that says that the kids are allowed to stay in the same school, why aren't they keeping them in the same school and providing transportation so those kids can go to those schools, even if their houses are nearby, if since this other situation is happening? I mean, of course, you would think if a kid goes to a school, no matter if that kid's a foster kid or not, any intelligent administrator should be putting, looking at the person's files to see the record to see when they, you know, when they change school. And I guess, I guess it depends on how many times this child came to school, but regardless, every child, a new child comes to your school, you should always look at the record. So, wouldn't it be more beneficial? I mean, even if this law comes about to just keep the kids in the same schools until another year rolls around, rather than if they change mid-year to a school, actually, to, if I mean, you know, 
<laughs> so what I'm trying to say is, if, yeah, rather than changing them mid-year to a school, just keeping them in the school they're in for another year and before they decide to switch them over to a separate school. Or maybe just keep them in the same school they're in for a period of time. And maybe if you have several kids at one time, uh, if all the kids who go to the same school, maybe they could get a, you know, a van or something and pick those kids up and she takes them to school a little bit earlier. But it would have, it also would give the kids stability so they are not constantly being moved around. I mean, high school is important for a kid and they should have the same kind of experience as most kids do. And having one school or, you know, two is great for a kid to have. I mean, most kids don't want to change schools unless they have to. I mean, you know, there's a reason they don't like the school particularly, but it leaves things behind. So it's more than just education. It's also getting an idea because if they're moving around their real lives, they should just have something stable. Exactly. And their life, I think a high school education, such as a good school, you nailed would be beneficial it. for those kids <clears throat> and also to the community and make friends with other kids, actually, so they could have a bit of normality while everything at home might be a little bit shaked up. But that's just my own opinion. Well, Brandy, you nailed it. That's what this legislation is about. SB, <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, the School of Origin Law, SB 445 states exactly what you just stated, that if that is a elementary or middle school foster youth, they have the right to stay in that school, whatever school that they attended until the end of the school year. And if that student is in high school, they get the right to stay there in that high school until they graduate. So you're absolutely right. When January, January of 2016, we're going to have to look at how are school districts going to make sure that that happens for foster youth. And that's why I was asking on our radio show today, how could they collaborate? How could school districts, Children's Court, and DCFS, how could we collaborate to make sure that these new laws really go into effect for children? Because what we see all too often in children's court as education rights holders, that kids are moving from school to school and repeating classes far too often. And as you know, um, a good high school education is the foundation for your next step in life. And our listener Brandy's on the on the line with us and Brandy, I shared earlier that 50% of foster youth end up homeless after they leave, one year after they leave the children's court system. Just imagine how important an education is to that foster child. It's the difference to me, in my little opinion, and in the opinion of Dr. Anissa McNeil, a solid education could be the difference between night and day. Having a high school diploma can be the difference between the ability to get a job and the ability to, or you experiencing homelessness. Any other questions, Brandy? Well, I guess I would just, my final comment would be that, you know, an education course is great. I mean, we all need one section in the society. And I, but I think also what would really be great too was beyond, just beyond getting a, your education, getting a bit of normality. I think in their world, it's so, for these children, for these kids, and we have to remember these are kids. You know, these are not adult sector who make form decisions with their lives. These are kids who are circumstances of their parents misbegotten deeds or whatever hell they put in to excuse my language. But these kids deserve to have not just a great education, they deserve to have a bit of normality. And being able to be in one school for a while provides stability and normality of having to have friends who you grow with. I have my best friend who I've been friends for 20-something years. I could have had that relationship, actually, if I had been changed from school to school. You don't have time to grow those friendships. Those friendships that when you're down and you need somebody to be there for you, or if you feel like you have nowhere to go, because you don't have a family to call back on the phone, but you're afraid to say, you know what, she's going to stay with me for a while. You know, so That's getting their education is great. That's like the number one thing. But we should also pull to the table to these people, because these kids, they have to build relationships with people, because right now in their lives, they have no city relationships, because your adults are shipping them from place to place to place, if they could have at least in their school to build friends and relationships with people that and they're not those people will stay with you. I mean, you have a best friend, I'm sure most people have a friend they've had most for many, many years. Sometimes you fall apart with people, but there's usually that one person that you've known for a very long time. I think we have to remember that. Think about also the people we've known who've been a big part of our lives because oftentimes those people who meet when we are in middle school or high school and those people are often the people you can turn to when you need the most because we all need someone. Someone else, especially in our own peer group, sometimes to talk to you, to fall back on, actually. And I think providing these kids with a great education that is stable, that 
So not only gives them a school, you know, place to go to the future, but even if they go to college and something happens and they funk out or they have issues for any kid, that doesn't matter if you're a foster kid or just a kid who has a home to go to, it's good to have a friend. And you can't build friendship if you can't stay with a loved one that could do so. So that, to me, it would be one of the things I would push for. If I were to stand in front of these counsel people and say, yes, I want them to have a great education because I believe that is most important, but I also want them to have some normality and they deserve to have a path, a life, what it's like to go through school. I went from one school, five years, to another school, three years, to another school, well, no, sixth grade center, to another school, three years, and then high school, four years. And most kids do, and those kids have the ability to do that and to grow with their friends. And not because their lives are so unstable to begin with being bounced around from home to home. They need at least one piece. Give them something, a, a steady education and the normality of peers that can really, right. I know in the world we see kids doing all types of terrible things, but our kid, our friends are often what keep us going. And I think You're that's right, something Brandy. that we need to speak about, too. Right. Anyway, that's we, all. Sorry, I'm kind of going. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Well, I appreciate the call. But you're absolutely right. We... The legislation, everyone, um, most people that work with foster youth say the same thing that you're saying. It's more than do they have the right to just stay in this school. And I use the words just stay in the school because it's never about just staying in a school. You hit the nail right on the head when you said it is about them having a normal second grade year. Start mm -hmm. second grade in August in second grade in May, and I got a chance to stay in one school, and this was my second grade teacher. Creating that sense of normalcy, just like most of our kids in public school have, is a great stabilizing factor for all of foster youth. The no, it's so very difficult to move from place to place to place and make friends. And it and you're right. It creates that sense of you're you're isolated. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. I had the privilege of taking a young lady. Uh, she was our scholarship awardee. I took her to college over this summer. And the one thing she said while I was taking her to college, she had gone to seventeen different schools. She said, "Dr. McNeil, it would be nice to stay at a school." for a long period of time. And she kept a binder that listed all of the schools that she attended. And all throughout her foster years, or her foster youth experience. And I said, wow, how many schools have you been to? And she said, 17. How many of us can say that we went to 17 schools? And then I asked her the incredible question I said to her, were you able to make friends at these schools? Do you have any friends that you're walking away from, from your educational experience? And she said, no, I'm just trying to be a little bit closer to my family. So I thank you. I thank you, Brandy, for calling in. And I thank you for being an active and engaged listener in our community that you speak up for foster youth and you really expounded upon the sentiments of our new legislation. This is new legislation like never before. We've never had these laws in effect that will help foster youth in this way. And for the first time since 2013, we've actually put money behind our, in our public education system, we put money behind them being successful. And this is, this is just wonderful. For all of you in, our, in the San Bernardino County and L.A. County, get involved. Stay tuned. Look at your LCAP that's on your local uh, school district's website. See how we're doing. Check up on it. See how foster youth in your community are doing. My name is Dr. Anissa McNeil. And you're listening to Foster to Foster Radio Show. I do the work and I tell the stories of foster youth. See you next week. Here's 
a look at the KCAA community calendar. I'm Di Rice. The fourth annual Eat and Be Well serves up free, fun food and much needed health services to the Inland Empire's underserved populations. The annual Project Boone event draws hundreds of people together for a fun-filled day of feasting, music and dancing.